It's Friday, June 26, 2020. Uh, today I have the pleasure of speaking with John Titus. His YouTube channel is Best Evidence. He does great videos, documentaries as well. Doesn't do as many videos as I do, but uh, they're all very good. Uh, Best Evidence seeks to chronicle major financial forces and legal changes behind America's last days as a sovereign republic, as the rule of law destroyed and the American people are disenfranchised and looted in broad daylight. I, I really enjoy watching um, John's videos and I've seen him in other, on other channels as well. And uh, it's really nice that uh, he accepted to come on uh, my channel. Uh, John, uh, welcome, thank you. Thank you, Mario. You, a lot of your followers have, have come over my way to let me know about you. Good, good. Yeah, a lot of them have asked me as well when you're going to interview John. And, uh, I, and I, I didn't know how to contact you, but then I looked on your channel and uh, you, I could see a uh, view email address. <laughs> it's just uh, easy. And then I contacted you. Um, yeah, we were talking before uh, our conversation or interview, whatever we're going to call it, that... Uh, you said what got you uh, into looking into the financial system, into the legal system, was the collapse of 08. Uh, on my side, I started looking into it in the early 2000s. I worked, I guess, in the belly of the, the beast, so to speak, in the city of London. And I realized when I started investing in gold and looking into gold and money that there was a problem with the system. So, uh, yeah. Can you tell us a little more about, uh, you know, your involvement then in, in, yeah. in uh, what you're doing? Sure. Um, well, like, I think like a lot of people, I was absolutely asleep in front of the television for decades. And then 2008 came along. Well, really 2007. And the Federal Reserve really started meddling uh, in, in, the, in the market there. And I don't even remember how I caught wind of it, but I began to take notice of the debt levels. And I started to read alternative blogs, uh, the ones that I could find, and really keep track of what was going on. And then in March of 2008 uh, was the bailout, really, of J.P. Morgan. It's cast as the bailout of Bear Stearns. It wasn't. It was a bailout of J.P. Morgan. Um, and I, I really started to watch really carefully then. And then when the bailouts, um, the TARP bailout passed, in early October of 2008, I, I, I was, I, I could not believe how angry I was at that. And that was sort of a, a turning point where I really started to, to drill down and pay attention. And um, I watched all the, I started to really pay attention to the Federal Reserve and what they were doing. Um, I didn't really understand a lot of what I was reading, but I read and read and read and read. I was a lot like a cow. I had to eat, you know, 10 forests to produce a burger. But, you know, I just kept at it and kept reading. And finally, just the turning point of when I'd said, you know, I think I might have something to contribute in this space was when we started to see banks, if not plead guilty to criminal fraud, at least not be very convincing denying it. And then to watch the Justice Department not prosecute again, and again and again, and then I, 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 I have a legal background. I, I do patent litigation, so I don't. It's not. I have a legal background. I don't have a financial background. I don't have a trading background. I'm, I'm basically a litigator, and, and I, I use that to, to start telling stories, you know, to sort of do my own sort of documentary work, where I thought a lot of the current work. In, in being done, and even even a lot of work in the alternative space really wasn't getting at the problem that I was seeing. And that problem was the loss of sovereignty of the US. And that that's really when I sort of said, you know, I went from a, a reader and a watcher to an active participant and to a contributor. And that, that process really began, uh, that started in 2000, 2013, 2014. And I, I've never, you know, I've never really looked back. I don't produce a lot of work, as you know. Um, I, 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 I kind of pick my spots, but I've, I've gotten back into it now, and I'm working on, working on things now.
but that's basically it. It's interesting that you, you uh, said that uh, the uh, Bear Stearns uh, takeover of J.P. Morgan was actually a J.P. Morgan bailout. Uh, yes. I thought I knew what was going on, and, but I had never realized that. Uh, and the, the, what I thought it was uh, that uh, the Fed, New York Fed said to uh, J.P. Morgan, you know, uh, take over Bear Stearns and we'll help you bail out Bear Stearns. Could you tell us what you know more about uh, the fact that you think J.P. Morgan was actually bailed out? Yeah, sure. Um, the best article on what happened to Bear Stearns uh, in March of 2008 was written by a Chicago options trader named John O'Legs. That's O-L-A-G-U-E-S. And that uh, article he wrote, I think it was reproduced by Ellen Brown on her website, Web of Debt, maybe FT Alphaville. I can't remember where. But I read it and he forensically went through the evidence leading up to the collapse of Bear Stearns and shows, basically proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that Bear Stearns was pushed in front of the bus. And he surmised that the reason for that was that the powers that be wanted to bail out J.P. Morgan. It really had nothing to do with Bear Stearns. And if you look at why it was a bailout of J.P. Morgan and not so much Bear Stearns, Bear Stearns doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and all the Fed money that went into that bailout, I believe it was $20 billion for Bear Stearns and $25 billion or $30 billion for J.P. Morgan or maybe flipped around. But all, of that, all the money from, that, from the Federal Reserve in that transaction came from um, the Federal Reserve, and it ends up in J.P. Morgan's pocket. And you have to remember that the Fed is bailing out. Um, when, it, when it bails out two different entities like that, J.P. Morgan being a commercial bank and Bear Stearns being an investment bank, the, the Federal Reserve's currency is reserves. It's, it's not uh, checkable accounts or dollars that you and I spend. It's, 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 it's reserves and the beneficiary of reserves, the entity as between JP Morgan Chase and Bear Stearns that transacts its business in reserves is not the investment bank. It's the commercial bank. That, that episode was most certainly a bailout of JP Morgan Chase. Um, but the best account of that, as I said, is by a guy named John O'Legs. Yeah. And I think a lot of that, uh, money and, uh, transaction, the Fed put it on something called Maiden Lane. Have you heard of that? Yeah. In yeah. fact, Maiden Lane has just recently uh, magically reappeared on the Fed's balance sheet this year. Yes. Yeah, so they're probably using that again to bail out the banks again, like they're yeah, doing I, now, I, it seems. There might even be two Maiden Lanes anyway. Yeah. that yeah. Maiden Lane is a special purpose vehicle. Yeah. And the Fed uses special purpose. Whenever you see a special purpose vehicle in connection with the Federal Reserve, it means that the Federal Reserve wants to do something illegal. Um, for example, the Fed is prohibited from doing certain things. For It's not supposed to bail out specific entities, um, but it does that. And in fact, the, the J.P. Morgan bailout via Bear Stearns is just one, one, one such episode. Uh, and that, that's why you see the special purpose vehicles. Another thing the Fed's not supposed to do is to um, buy assets other than assets that are backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. So when the Fed wants to buy toxic, um, you know, say mortgage-backed securities, a lot of times you'll see that. You'll see mortgage-backed securities may be a bad example because they sort of fudge that one. But let's say they, you know, they want to buy a dead cow belonging to Jamie, Di Jamie Diamond. They'll use a special purpose vehicle to do that because there's not even a colorable argument that the cow is backed by the full faith and credit of the United States, where there, there is a colorable argument. It's not particularly persuasive about mortgage-backed securities having uh, the backing of, you know, Fannie Mae and Fr Freddie Mac and having a government guarantee. They try to they try to slop the government guarantee into full faith and credit. It's in a, it's a false argument, but it's one they make that has some superficial plausibility. But the special purpose vehicle is a surefire sign that there is illegality afoot. Yeah, aren't they also uh, like uh, held offshore, like in tax havens, S SPVs? That I don't know. It would not surprise me though. Um, yeah. The Fed is pretty meticulous about dotting I's and crossing P's when it comes to legalities and, and when it comes to notions of issuance and who is issuing currency and who is issuing money. The Fed is pretty careful about what it, what it does there. 
And I'm not entirely certain about why that's the case. Yeah. Um, but, but it is, I, I've noticed that they're very particular about um, being, being careful with transactions and how they're set up. They're, they're really the masters of structured finance live at the federal reserve and, and in the New York fed in particular. They must have a, a lot of high-paid lawyers. <laughs> oh, don't you know it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess they wouldn't want to hire you. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm a low-paid one. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, the uh, yeah. Do you think the uh, maybe just a little more on the J.P. Morgan? I don't want to stay there too long. Do you think it? Some people speculate that uh, because at the time gold was at an all-time high, like above a thousand. I even remember the day. When they took over uh, Bear Stearns, gold topped at a thousand and thirty. Silver was like at fifty. Uh, I, I think it was thirty-five. I don't know, but a lot of people speculate that J.P. Morgan was short the metals and they were losing a lot of money. Do you think it could have been because of that or something else? Yeah, you know, I never made that connection, which is odd because I was heavily invested. Uh, I, I just started to get into gold. Yeah. Um, in March of 2008. And I know that's exactly when that episode happened. That never crossed my mind, Mario. Like oh, I said, right. I'm, that's, not, a, I'm yeah. not a finance yeah. guy. No, that's but I fine. would not put it past him. Yeah. The, uh, the other thing I wanted to uh, touch upon, because you talk about how you got really angry. And I was angry as well, because I remember the Congress uh, first uh, voting down uh, the TARP. Yes. And the market went down quite a bit. I think it went down... Was it 666 points or some like significant number, like a symbol, symbol, symbolic number? And yeah. then I, I think uh, basically uh, Hank Paulson, ex Goldman Sachs CEO, then Treasury, uh, begged Nancy Pelosi. I think he got on his knee uh, to beg her to uh, save uh, the banks, basically. But uh, you talk a lot about. Uh, collateral consequence. Uh, can you tell our viewers how important that is for the banks and the legal system and how that term is really basically, uh, like you, you, you said in your videos, uh, America's become uh, a country of men, uh, the flag's yeah. upside down and the law is not there anymore. Right. But let me back up to what you said about yeah. the, the, the TARP. It, it did. It was it vo voted down on September 29th, 2008. And then four days later on October 3rd, it passes. So what happened in the interim? Well, 55 congressmen changed their vote from, from no to yes. And that episode, the flip-flopping of 55 uh, congressmen is t t one of the most underreported episodes in American history. Like what happened there? Uh, Marcy Kaptur, uh, there was an interview she did with Michael Moore in Capitalism, A Love Story. That movie is not very good, but it's, it's worth looking at just for that interview he does with Marcy Kaptur, a uh, congressman from, from Ohio. And she says, you know, a lot of people were made a lot of promises. She says, I know of a couple of people, uh, House members who were, who were promised the Senate seats, and they changed their vote. And they, they may not have gotten Senate seats, but they got rewarded. So that was a very dark episode to me for an American history. Yeah. Collateral Consequences comes up four years later, uh, 2012. HSBC is under investigation for laundering money um, for drug dealers and terrorists. Uh, and UBS is under indictment a second time for tax evasion. It's a, it's a recidivist. And what happens in both cases is those companies don't deny that they're guilty. Um, but they came out, the Justice Department comes out and says, you know, we can't prosecute these banks because of be, there will be collateral consequences. And, and they, they sort of, there wasn't much coverage of this, but basically collateral consequences is a factor in the U.S. Attorney's Manual that prosecutors are able to look at, they're sort of supposed to consider when they are considering whether or not to indict a corporation. Now, normally indictments are of individuals, and okay? they're for officers, directors, employees who are acting as, you know, they're, they're committing crimes. You only reach the issue of collateral consequences, at least in theory, you're only supposed to reach the issue of collateral consequences 
when the crimes of the employees of the bank or of the corporation are so heinous and so unforgivably so beyond the pale of you know of decent human conduct that that you have to prosecute the corporation that it's fair to go ahead and prosecute the corporation and that was trotted out as a reason for not prosecuting HSBC and for not prosecuting U UBS. And the DOJ announced this, I think it was the last week of 2012. And that was the reason they had given. Now, what was interesting about that is prior to the time when the DOJ came and revealed that, up until that point, there had been a lot of hearings in the House and the Senate alike, where people from the DOJ, including Lanny Brewer, the head of the criminal division, had said up until that point, that the reason they weren't prosecuting was they couldn't marshal the evidence, that it was too hard to prove these crimes. And people were like, well, I guess, you know, it's so hard to prove the crime. And then at the end of 2012, we learned that wasn't the reason at all. That Lanny Brewer and the gang at the DOJ had simply lied to Congress. And that the real reason they weren't prosecuting was that this, there was a doctrine in the U.S. Attorney's Manual called collateral consequences. Now, why is all this important? The reason this is important is that a it extends to officers and it's not just that they're not prosecuting the corporations they're not prosecuting anybody in those companies and b because here's the real reason if somebody is shielded from paying for a crime if they're shielded from criminal liability due to any any sort of doctrine that person has criminal immunity and that's problematic in a in a constitutional republic because we know from the Watergate episode, that not even the president has criminal immunity. I mean, I guess the waters were never tested there, and arguably the sitting president would be immune from prosecution. But it's, it's, beyond, it's, it's beyond dispute that a president, once he steps down from office, he's then, it's open season. Okay, if you've committed crimes as, as the president and your term of office is up and you go back to your regular life, they're coming for you. You're going to be prosecuted. And we know that because Nixon needed to get a pardon from Gerald Ford after he left office. And what we learned with the prosecution of banks and the non-prosecution of banks is that those officers and those corporations and those bankers and those banks, they are never prosecuted, ever. They, that once they have immunity, they, they have immunity forever. And so the problem now is you have banks, commercial banks, and really big, huge investment banks, basically the too big to fail, who have more, they have, they have a sovereign power that no one in the republic has. And that really, if you think about that, that makes, if you have criminal immunity, you are the sovereign, okay? Not, not the sovereign of the textbooks. It's not the House and the Senate and the judiciary and the, and the executive branch. That's all out the window because no one in any of those three places in any of those three branches is above the law. In other words, you could be prosecuted. You don't have criminal immunity. Criminal immunity is one thing that caused people to revolt in 1775, 1776. They were sick of a king who could just, you know, commit crimes of, you know, on a whim with complete impunity and they overthrew it. They, that's, that's a large part what the revolution was about. And now we come, you know, here we are. 230 some odd years later, and we have people in our system who not only have criminal immunity, it's one thing to say, hey, that guy has criminal immunity, and, and you're, you're making that argument as a matter of fact. We, we, we have people in the Department of Justice telling you, as a matter of policy, these people are above the law. Now, they talk about it on both sides of their mouth, but if they were serious about it, they would scotch the provision in the U.S. Attorney's Manual about collateral consequences, but no one's going to do that. It's there. And so now that's who your real sovereign is. The sovereign power in the U.S. isn't the president. It's not the courts. It's not the legislature. The sovereign power in the United States is commercial banks. It's large commercial banks. Yeah, and and they're, they're not even necessarily American. They could be, you know, the foreign uh, too big to fail, who are HSP part of the, the B, yeah, the uh, part of the BIS, uh, uh, you know, club or cabal. Uh, right. Didn't didn't uh, Goldman Sachs get away as well from criminal prosecution because of 
collateral consequence and no can, oh no no they're okay so, let me, so collateral consequences comes up at the end of 2012 all right Goldman Sachs evades prosecution remember Goldman Sachs was wrapped up in all these frauds like Timberwolf and Hudson was it? Hudson there was another one called Hudson yeah. investments there's another one called abacus and what Goldman was doing was that they were defrauding their own clients they were going to their clients saying hey wouldn't you like to invest in Hudson it's a great investment their clients would in, would plow all this money into it and Goldman wouldn't tell them that Goldman itself was shorting Hudson and so the, the clients would you know invest a million dollars in Hudson and Goldman would have put a million dollars short on Hudson it was just straight up fraud and that and Goldman uh, evaded prosecution they wouldn't have prosecuted but the reason they get off for that is, and they get off in 2010. The, the, the Justice Department comes out in 2000. It might have been, it might have been as late as the summer of 2012. But at some point, the Justice Department releases a statement saying we're not going to prosecute Goldman, and the reason we're not going to prosecute prosecute Goldman is that we don't have enough evidence. That that was the reason stated oh, by, the, by the DOJ. So that was sort of the class, and that's what they had been telling Congress the whole time. There's not enough evidence. It's really hard to prove intent. It's, it's basically impossible to ever convict, convict anybody of fraud because it's so hard to prove criminal intent. And so we're going to give Goldman a pass. And it was only a, it was after that where the real reason comes out that the Justice Department was using these so-called collateral consequences. And Lanny Brewer in the DOJ, as it turned out, had given a speech in front of the New York City Bar Association in September of 2012, in which he said, I've had a lot of people over the years come into my, in my conference room and argue that indicting the, the company would be really bad for the whole world and there, the whole world would end. Yeah. They were, in other words, he was, Lanny Brewer was hosting people in the DOJ saying, hey, come on in, tell your chicken little story about why we can't prosecute your bank for fleecing all your customers, then we'll give you a pass and then we'll go have drinks afterwards. Doesn't that sound like fun? And so he gives a speech in front of the New York City Bar Association. And what happens then is that that fact comes out in a blog. I believe it was Empty Wheel um, reveals that. And that was that speech was September 2012. And then there's a series, that actually it's a one-off on, on PBS Frontline called The Untouchables by Martin Smith. And Martin Smith catches wind. Of this of the New York City Bar Association speech, and he asked for he said, "Hey, you know, this what's this deal with collateral consequences? Is this really what you should be doing? Is sitting up at night worrying about prosecuting banks?" And Brewer says, "Yeah, it's my job. You know, I got I, I've I, I've got to consult with experts and regulators about whether there's going to be collateral consequences." So he had to cop to it, but notice that right away he's he's lying. Brewer is lying right out of the gate because three months ago. He's in front of the bar association saying, hey, you guys, you know, your arguments about collateral consequences, they're, they're so persuasive that, you know, that's why I'm not prosecuting. That's why I'm not indicting people. And then three months later, when Martin Smith asked him on the untouchables, suddenly he's not, it's no longer the lawyers who are persuading him. It's these so-called regulators and experts yeah. who, who never existed. He just made them up. He's lying through his teeth. It was his buddies at the bar association who convinced them. Now, he said so. And so that's sort of the history of collateral consequences. And, but it's very, very dangerous because it, it subverts the rule of law. And it says, it comes out in the open and says, these people here, they're above the law. You can't touch them. They are above the law. And that's the authorities telling you that. Now, think about that. One of the reasons that makes, one of the things that makes the U.S. great is we have a level playing field for everybody. And we at least now in practice, you know, there's, there is an equality before the law. Everybody knows that. And that would be a dumb argument to say that, in fact, everybody is equal in front of the law. The point of it is that you have that argument. You have that, that, that ammo to use against public officials, for example, in the civil rights, to be able to say, hey, you know, if everybody's equal, how is it that these people over here have to go to the back of the bus? And that rule of law the notion that no one's above the law's reach and no one's beneath its protection is a very, very powerful tool for the people to have because you can now hold the, the ruler's feet to the fire and say, really, this is really equality? 
and you make them put a bag over their heads and, and say, yeah, well, you know, it is equal. And now with, with collateral consequences, the bag's gone. You no longer have that argument because the officials are telling you as a matter of policy, there is no rule of law that these people here, they're above the law. You have no argument at all. Go home, accept it. And it's the same. Yeah, that's what's so dangerous. It's the same here. I, I know you've been on the Kaiser report with Max Kaiser. And I remember years ago, listening to he interviewed a, a London city of London or metropolitan police. Uh, Ian Fraser. Yeah. And he said that the last time they prosecuted and uh, imprisoned a banker from the city of London was like in the late 80s. And then after that, a few years later, he was told not to touch them anymore. So it's the same thing here uh, in the UK. Um, yes. They're above the law as well. Um, maybe uh, you could talk a little bit about, I don't know if you've read this book, The Tower of Basel. This is no. about about the Bank for International Settlements, about it. It says it's the, uh, the shadowy history of the secret bank that runs the world. Maybe you could tell the viewers how the BIS helped HSBC get away with crime in the U.S. and how the DOJ was involved? Yeah, the um, let's just kind of go from the ground up. The, the U, I'll just talk about the U.S. first. We have the central bank as the Federal Reserve. And, you know, in the U.K., the, the central bank is the, the Bank of England. And in Europe, it's, you know, the European Central Bank and so on and so forth. So each, each country has a central bank. So the, the, the central bank is the bank of banks, okay? So the Federal Reserve is where J.P. Morgan Chase and Bank of America and Citigroup and Wells Fargo and all the commercial banks, they bank at the Federal Reserve, okay? Where do the central banks bank? Well, they all bank at the Bank for International Settlements. So the Bank for International Settlements is at the tip of the pyramid. It was created in 1930. Its headquarters are in Basel, Switzerland. It has an agreement with Basel, Switzerland. It has, an, it has an agreement with Switzerland that basically confers complete immunity on the bank. Um, I don't know why Switzerland agreed to that. I don't know, but they did. So they can't, the people, if they're in Basel, if they're inside the Bank for International Settlements, they cannot be prosecuted. Their assets cannot be reached. Switzerland has no right to look at any of their documents. I mean, it's like basically, it's a country within a country. The Bank for International Settlements is a country inside of a country. It is its own sovereign. That's, that's what it is. And that agreement they have with, this, with Switzerland, that was forged, I think, in 1930 or 35. It's been modified over the years. But in essence, that agreement uh, has a bunch of provisions that govern the disposition of rights and assets and you know, personas in the Bank for International Settlements. And it's that headquarters agreement that gives confers immunity, not only in the bank, but on the bank's assets, on the bank's possessions, on its documents, and on its personnel. And it confers immunity on its personnel forever. That once you've been you know, inside the bank or work for the bank or whatever, that immunity goes on forever and ever and ever. Now, why is this important if it's inside Switzerland? Well, I did a documentary um, called All the Plenary's Men uh, because there is, inside the Bank for International Settlements, there is a subgroup whose legal status is a little shadowy. Um, it's not a full-fledged bank. It's called the Financial Stability Board. And the Financial Stability Board is the who's who of you know the bank in the world so i think the head of the fsb is still mark carney no, but in actually, any event, so, sorry sorry to interrupt you i think now it's randall quarles who's okay. the uh, okay. vice yeah. chair of the federal reserve board uh yeah he used to be mark carney, was before, carney for a long time. and before yeah. carney was mario draghi yeah um, both of those guys are Goldman guys. Goldman, yeah. But the point of this is that the, in, I think it was 2010 or so, the Financial Stability Board, putatively in response to the global financial crisis, came out with a list of what they called uh, SIFIs, systemically important financial institutions. And there was a list. They had a physical list. You know, you could read it. It was 30 banks. And it included banks like, you know, UBS and, Goldman Sachs and HSBC. And so there was this list of banks 
that was systemically important financial institutions. And the reason that became important is that when HSBC was under indictment uh, in the U.S. for laundering money for drug dealers and terrorists, um, the DOJ had actually decided that it was going to prosecute HSBC. But what nobody really knew at that time was that um, because HSBC was a SIFI, there were members of the Financial Stability Board sitting in on internal DOJ meetings, okay? So go back to the Financial Stability Board. I think that the, the way it works is each country, let's take the U.S., I think in the U.S., the FSB has three, let's say, representatives in the, in the Financial Stability Board. And they're, they're representatives based on their position. So I think it, the head of the Federal Reserve is a, is a FSB member. The, the head of the Treasury is a, is a member of the FSB automatically. And I believe it's the head of the Securities and Exchange Commission. But it's, the point is there's three. And what, the, um, what nobody knew inside the DOJ when they were talking about prosecuting HSBC is that you had sort of a mole for the Financial Stability Board, you know, listening in on those meetings. Now, it didn't have to be the Treasury. It didn't have to be the Treasurer, who at that time I think was Tim Geithner. Um, it could have been a representative. But in any way, the point is that the word of the impending prosecution of, of HSBC got back to the Financial Stability Board. Um, it gets back to the FSB. And in the UK, um, the, the FSB members included uh, George Osborne, who was head of the Exchequer. It included, um, I'm going to reach for a name here. Yeah, Adair Turner. The yeah, Adair F Turner. FSA. Yep. And the uh, Bank of England. Yep. And it included Mervyn King. Yeah, Mervyn, Mervyn King. King. Yeah, those guys. And the difficulty was that, that, that um, George Osborne, I believe, and Adair Turner both had, had – they were not only in the FSB, but they were officers in the FSB. And so they got together and said, hey, you know, we found out about this prosecution of HSBC going on in the U.S. That case was pending in Brooklyn. Brooklyn's not in the U.K. Brooklyn's <laughs> in, in the United States. It's in, it's in New York. And – George Osborne, as a ranking member, as an officer, basically at the FSB, writes a letter to Tim Geithner and Ben Bernanke, which is curious because as, as the head of the exchequer, George Osborne is a cabinet member in the UK and should have been writing his letter to the cabinet member in the US in charge of that prosecution, which would have been the Attorney General Eric Holder. George Osborne did not do that because he was not writing in his, even though he was using Bank of England, or even though he was using uh, Exchequer letterhead, he was in fact writing that letter in his capacity as an FSB officer. And in that letter, he says to Ben Bernanke and Tim Geithner, do not prosecute these banks. Now, he doesn't come out and say that. He says, if you prosecute these banks, uh, if you prosecute HSBC, there'll be all these collateral consequences and um, HSBC is a systemically important financial institution. And when he uses that magic phrase, SIFI, you know, those guys know what he means. They're a SIFI. Ah, you're telling us, you know, he's a, he, 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 basically they're, they're on the SIFI list and yeah. we need to go back and we need to refer to the headquarters agreement and see what it says about our membership. And if you follow the prosecution from that point forward, and if you follow any prosecution of any bank in the DOJ, in the U.S. from that time, what you will see is that those prosecutions do not follow American law. Instead, they track the headquarters agreements. And you see that again and again and again. And that is why, and so when I did that documentary, All the Plenary's Men, it explains, it lays out how the prosecutions of banks in the U.S., they don't, they don't follow the U.S. law. That's out the window. They follow the headquarters agreement. The headquarters is uh, Basel, right? Headquarters is Basel. And the headquarters, headquarters is the agreement in the Bank for International Settlements uh, 
that spells out the amenities. Let me sort of explain. So you've got a very knowledgeable viewer base. Um, I've seen you know a lot of their comments of really knowledgeable people, so I can just say this and you'll understand. The way to think about the Financial Stability Board within the Bank for International Settlements is sort of like the model I'm convinced is really, um, it's sort of like the Exchange Stabilization Fund and the New York Fed. Yes, the Exchange Stabilization Fund is part of the Treasury. However, where is the Exchange Stabilization Fund housed? Why, it's in the New York Federal Reserve's office. Isn't that curious? And that's really the FSB. So yes, the FSB is its own organization, but it's in, it's in the Bank for International Settlements, and it is governed by those uh, international, the, the Bank for International Settlements, the BIS provisions. Would you say then that, I mean, uh, you've talked about how the sovereign now, the banks are sovereign because they're, uh, yes. they're, they're immune from prosecution. Would you say that the head sovereign then is in Basel? And I, I know that the, the general manager of the BIS is not very important in the scheme of things, but uh, we know that the uh, head, heads of all the major central banks, they go every two months to the BIS for, for right. a nice, nice dinner. And then when they go there, they go as BIS uh, officers and they, they've got diplomatic passports and all that. Right. So the, the BIS is almost like a, like a legal instrument uh, for the central bankers in each country to do their dirty work, it seems. Well, the way I would look at it, Mario, is that <clears throat> the, 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 the power of criminal immunity, that, that, that's, an, that's an equation with sovereignty. And the reason for that is that if you have criminal immunity, you don't really need sovereign power as a constitutional matter. You know, for example, you don't need the power, the constitutional power to raise standing armies. If you have criminal immunity, you can just go ahead and raise standing armies. And if you ever get called on it, just say there will be collateral consequences and plead immunity. You don't need the power to print money. Um, if you have criminal immunity, you can just counterfeit money. And if you get called on it, just you know, use your criminal immunity trump card. So knowing that those banks have criminal immunity, and knowing that that power confers on them sovereignty, meaning that the, that the actual government, that we the people aren't sovereign, and that really we're subjects of the banks, that really is what you need to know. And that, that the Bank for International Settlements then becomes the organizational umbrella under which the real sovereigns in all these countries are operating. And if you look at the FSB and if you look at the BIS, the, the part of the problem, and I talk about this in all the plenary's men, part of the problem is that the FSB in particular, everybody in that organization is wearing two hats. They're an FSB member on the one hand, but on the other hand, the whole reason they're there is that they're, you know, they're the head of the treasury in their country, or they're the head of the central bank in their country. And so they, they're wearing two hats wherever they go. And in the FSB, you have the head of the FSB at that time being Mark Carney, you know, they can invite in whoever they want um, to, the, to the meetings. So, and, and you'll never get any minutes of the meetings. There's no transcripts of these meetings. These things are conducted in complete darkness. You don't have any right to see any of that. So you, only, you don't know what's going on there. All you know is that the representative of your country who should be representing you is in that country. And, and guess who he's really representing if he's there with, with a bunch of people who have criminal immunity. I mean, it's not that, this is not complicated math to figure out, to follow the ball and figure out who the sovereign is. Sovereign's the banks. And the banks are organized under the Bank for International Settlements. End of story. Yeah, uh, I've got a, a little story, a personal story. Uh, when we uh, put our old house for sale back in, uh, I think, 2015, 2014, we had a viewer and... Uh, he worked for the Bank of England, and he said, oh, I've been in, uh, working in uh, Switzerland, in Basel. And I said, well, were you working at the BIS? And he said, yes, I was there working for a few years. So they, they, he was a researcher, uh, economist. So they even sent their own, uh, they call it, is it on secondment, they call it, I think. So basically, the Bank of England is still paying him, but he's going to work at the BIS. So yeah. it's not only like the top guys. They sent even all their uh, 
lower level guys. Uh, he didn't end up by my house though. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a good thing. Yeah. So his uh, check, his check wouldn't have bounced. You know, well, so he bounced. was telling us that he had to, uh, go uh, and apply for a mortgage. So <laughs> I don't think the Bank of England does mortgages. So he, he was going to have to apply uh, at a mortgage broker, which is which I thought was strange. But uh, uh, just wanted to ask you, because you talk about how the banks are sovereign uh, and uh, there's a lot of people out there who, who still tend to think that uh, President Trump is going to, uh, drain the swamp and I heard in one of your videos that politics is just kabuki theater and I agree with you Can you tell tell the viewers your view on that? Yeah um, Since the banks are sovereign what, what that means and, and this has really happened formally uh, In the last few years say in the last ten years where the DOJ has said They come right out and say these banks if we can't prosecute them because there'd be these collateral consequences and that doctrine is still on the books. That, that means that the banks are sovereign. And so that means that we, the people are not sovereign. There can't be two Kings in a kingdom. And so if the banks are sovereign, it means we, the people, it's the third, first three words in the constitution are not sovereign. Um, we're subjects. It's we, the bankers then. It, it's we, we, the bankers are in, in charge. And in fact, if you look at the monetary system, not only in the U.S., but you know, everywhere in the West, you know, really there's there's two there's two people fall into one of two categories. There's people who are allowed to create money out of thin air and lend it out at interest, and there's the rest of us who borrow that money at interest. And so that that's that's really the rub of it. Um, and so when we come to the notion of criminal immunity and President Trump and all the rest, there's been a coup d'état. Right, we the people somewhere along the line we were overthrown, and now the now the real sovereign is bankers, and so the notion now after the coup d'état that you were going to vote your way out of that you're somehow going to reverse that by going to a voting booth and following legal procedures is utterly ridiculous. That does that makes no sense. Did you not hear the part? about the coup d'etat and the overthrow and the true sovereign, do you really think the banks are going to allow you know, a, some peon president to have any real power? Please. That's just, that, you know, you have to be nine years old to believe that, given everything that's happened and given the state of the fear affairs and given the fact that the president can't commit crimes with impunity. Can he? No. That, you know, we've learned that again and again and again, but the banks can. We're not going to vote our way out of this. And it's not going to end well either. Yeah, and, uh, you know, the collateral consequence, uh, it's good enough for the bankers for that to be applied. But if you think about what's happening now with this health crisis, uh, they don't care about the collateral consequences. They're locking down all, you know, the world economy and look at the consequences. So it's like a, it's like a double standard, it seems to me. Uh, and... Uh, can you maybe talk about um, how Powell is using this health crisis or the coronavirus to basically cover for uh, more and more bail out of Wall Street? Sure. Um, it's, a, it's a double whammy. Um, you know, when the Fed, it, it's padded its balance sheet, I think it's increased its balance sheet by something like you know, 65 to 70% in the space of 15 weeks. You know, all that money that the Fed adds to the balance sheet um, is created out of thin air. It, it's reserves. You know, that money doesn't, you know, reserves don't circulate in the population, which, which you know, the, the Federal Reserve members are happy to tell you anytime someone says, oh, well, you know, you're, 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 prop, you're doing this to prop up the stock market. That's their first thing they say. Well, reserves don't circulate in the regular economy, which is true as far as it goes. They're leaving out a big part. I'm making a video about that now. But that whole thing, reserves do bail out banks, you know, commercial banks, because the commercial banks, unlike the rest of us, they do tran transact their, their business in reserves. The reserves, there's another term for reserves. It's called, um, they're sort of thinking of them as Chuck E. Cheese tokens. They're also called exchange settlements. 
Um, it, it's basically a way for banks to settle the score uh, amongst themselves once the customer accounts have been, you know, all the transfers have been added up both ways and netted out. That's how banks settle up between themselves is with exchange settlements or, or reserve money. But the, so there's two different monetary circuits in, in play, both in the U.S. and in England, everywhere else. So the, the Fed expanding its balance sheet does, it undoubtedly helps commercial banks, number one. But the real problem in all of this is in, is in the lockdowns and shutting down Main Street and creating basically a depression. And this depression is going to be just like all the other depressions in that, A, it's intentionally caused, or just like the depression of 1929 was intentionally caused, the depression of 1920 was intentionally caused by the Federal Reserve, the depression of 1907 intentionally caused by the bankers back then, you go back 1893, 1873, you go back every single depression. The, the depressions are natural. It's not a natural thing to have happen. It's an intentional act. And it's an intentional act of constricting, contracting the money supply because the money, you can do that when the money supply is based on debt, right? You can call the debts and cancel the money. You can't do that with, with normal money. But debt money, you can cancel. And that, so the depressions are caused intentionally. And the purpose of causing depressions intentionally is that the Wall Street bankers want to buy up viable, main, otherwise viable Main Street businesses for pennies on the dollar, but they don't want to pay dollar on a the dollar. They want to get something for nothing. So they crush the businesses and you know, through whatever means they, they can, whether it's contracting the money supply or imposing lockdowns based on a bunch of nonsense. Um, and then they go and they, they swoop in like, like buzzards and they, they pick the carcass clean. And that's what they're going to do now. And it's, going to, it, it, it's increasing the concentration of huge corporations because the huge corporations Guess who they're beholden to? Well, take a look at their balance sheet. They all have huge debts with the usual suspects, the commercial banks. So that's really, in my view, what's going on. The balance sheet expansion is going on, um, and that, that's just being recycled into the stock market. And I'll get into that in my next video about how the, the mechanics of that. It's not, it's not as obvious as, as it appears. But, if you, but I'll tell you this. If you look at the expansion of the Federal Reserve balance sheet in the last 15, 16 weeks, You'll see that it's up by, I don't know, 70% or whatever it is. If you go and look at M2 at the same time, you can actually, for the first time ever, you couldn't see this back when they're doing this in 2008, 2010, 2013. Fed expands the balance sheet. Yeah, M2 would expand, but you, could, you couldn't really see it. Now, if you go look at the graph of M2 on the Federal Reserve website, the St. Louis Fed, you can see M2 tracking the Federal Reserve's expansion of the balance sheet. So this notion that they're expanding reserves and it's only expanding reserves, is that, that's the total lie. And I'm going to get into how that works, how that game is played. But that money, that expansion in M2, which is bankable money, that's check accounts and money that you and I use and we transact in, that's being recycled right into the stock market. And if you look at the timing of this, take a look at the S&P 500, look at that graph, and look at when the Fed – Extend, it starts expanding its balance sheet. And what you will see there is the most miraculous stick save in the history of graphs. Yeah, and uh, I've noticed, though, uh, the last couple of weeks that uh, the Fed's balance sheet has actually come, come off. Yes. Like, yesterday they published it and the yes. week before. Any reason why? Could it be with the uh, – they're stopping the uh, swaps with foreign central banks? Is that what it is, you think? They they got what they needed. Yeah. So that, that's my answer. I don't I don't know yeah. the answer to that yet, Mario, but yeah. The last two weeks it's been flat for sure. Yeah, and I saw the stock market today just before we, we got together. I think the Dow dropped seven hundred points. So uh it looks like uh the balance sheet is like topping and the stock market seems to be topping. So be interesting to uh keep an eye on things going forward. Yeah. It, it will be because if you look at the expansion of the balance sheet, the Federal Reserve assets, and you look at the expansion in the same time period of M2, what you will see is that M2 expanded to the tune of 85 cents on the dollar during this, during this orgy over the last 16 weeks. That's unprecedented. How Before, is that? 
all these business, they're out of business. How, how is yeah. M2 going up? Is it all the money, there's all the checks they're sending to people? Maybe no, 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 I, no, I don't think so. I think it's, it's the way they structure transactions. When the Fed deals with the commercial bank, so let's say the Fed goes to JP Morgan Chase and says, hey, you know, we'll take that dead cow off your hands. You know, we'll give you a billion dollars for the dead cow and we'll give it to you in reserves. And the Fed now has a dead cow on its balance sheet and reserves are up. And JP Morgan Chase now has an asset where the, before they had a dead cow, now they have a billion dollars in reserves. So they tra that, that transaction is straightforward. When the Fed, though, buys an asset from someone other than a commercial bank, say an investment bank or an insurance company, it doesn't work that way. The way it works is the asset goes from the dead cow, let's say it starts at AIG, and the Fed buys a dead cow from AIG. Dead cow goes from AIG to the Fed, okay? The billion dollars goes to a commercial bank, right? That's a billion dollars in reserves. Then the commercial bank turns around and creates a billion dollars of bank money and gets that to the insurance company. So it's a two for one deal. It's not only a billion dollars in reserves, it's a billion dollars in bank money too. That's the deal. That's, that's why the M2 is going up. Is that the, when it's, you've got, it's, when you've it's got going to the non-financial institutions as well. It's going to non-commercial banks. Yeah, non-commercial Non-banking bank. financial institutions yeah. who right. are turning around and putting that money in the stock market. So uh, that's, it, that's how that shell game works. So, uh, yeah, we're almost up to the hour mark, so I won't yeah. keep you much longer, but I just wanted to ask you just one more question, and I think the, my viewers would love to hear about this. Can you explain to them how you can easily tell that uh, the Federal Reserve is a private uh, institution, especially the uh, regional reserve banks? Sure. Uh, there's, there's, two, there's two ways. One, one is just if you look at um, the weekly statement by the Federal Reserve, the week release, there's a table, I think it's t uh, table five or H5, or whatever it is, and it breaks the Federal Reserve balance sheet down into the 12 regional Federal Reserve banks. And so what you see there when you do that is that the Fed balance sheet is nothing but the sum of the balance sheet of 12 Federal Reserve banks. So then the question becomes, okay, who owns the, re the regional Federal Reserves? And to answer that question, all you need to do is go to a little publication by the New York Fed called I Bet You Thought, dot, dot, dot. And it's a publication from the 1970s. And right in that publication, uh, it says, the New York Federal Reserve is a privately owned institution. Yeah. It says, flat out, just says that. So do you think J.P. Morgan is the biggest shareholder, probably? J.P. Morgan. Probably, yeah. Yeah. Most likely. Yeah. Whoever the, whoever the Rothschilds. You know, representative is their biggest one. It's probably J.P. Morgan. I have no reason to, to doubt it. Yeah, and I, I would say the uh, Bank for International Settlements as well is probably uh, Rothschilds is behind that. Who no, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Oh, well, good, just, good luck getting that information. Yeah. Just another thing that I just wanted to tell you is really interesting because I'm originally from Brazil, and I was born in 1964, hence uh, Monaco 64. And uh, that was the year where there was a coup d'etat, a real coup, not a silent one, but a military uh -huh. coup in Brazil. I think it was in April. And uh, I was born in October. But, uh, and I never had looked into that. But looking at banking, central banking, uh, three or four years ago, I wanted to look into the Brazilian central bank. And uh, I went on Wikipedia, and it said that it was founded on December 31st, 1964. And I thought, well, that's strange. <laughs> you know, and uh, there's always talk that the CIA was behind the uh, coup in Brazil. So I kind of wondered, uh, maybe the previous president in Brazil didn't want to create a central bank. So they went in there and got rid of him. And uh, I, I don't know if it's coincidence, but it, it seems a bit, you know, 31st of December, 1964, you know, we get a central bank. They, they don't waste much time when they don't get no. their way. All right. No. Uh, well, John, it was great to uh, speak with you, and uh, I'm looking forward, uh, you know, to your next videos. And, uh, yeah, uh, can you tell uh, our viewers uh, where they can uh, look at uh, your work?
And I, all of my stuff is on YouTube. I don't have a Twitter. I don't have Facebook. I don't have a <laughs> So it's on it, my YouTube channel is called Best Evidence. Um, <laughs> if you could provide a link in your description. I will. I will. I will put a link to it. That would be the best way. <laughs> yeah, great. Thanks a lot, uh, John, and uh, have a great weekend. Thanks for having me, Mara. Good to meet you. Nice to meet you, too.